this time on Tunivision, we go Dutch. Well, we're German actually. Well, Japanese. I've been importing things from Holland again. Well, Maywood singles, obviously. But uh, the other thing I've been importing from Holland is a new MSX. Uh, you remember last year we looked at an MSX2 that I imported, a Sony Hitbit MSX2 that I now use for capture for all my videos. And uh, I couldn't get an MSX2 this time, well, one in decent condition. So I got this. And uh, it's a machine known in Japan as King Kong. And you'll see why. Goodness me. It weighs 3.6 kilos. So this is a Panasonic, a national in some countries, CF2700. And it is possibly one of the heaviest computers I've ever held in my hands, other than a PC with a big metal case. It weighs 3.6 kilos. Let's pop it down there. And you're thinking, oh, Chini, not another MSX1, because they're all the same. Well, yes, they kind of are. Uh, same hardware compatibility, run the same games. And of course, if you're in Europe and you haven't yet seen my 50 MSX games within 10 minutes video, then you'll associate the MSX with really dodgy Spectrum ports that run 20% slower uh, with games converted in a weekend. But if you've seen my 50 games on the MSX video, you'll know there's a wealth of games in Japan and... Uh, those guys could properly use the machine's hardware. Of course, anyone could produce an MSX machine, providing you adhered to the standard. So you've got everyone from Casio making really cheap machines that um, really have kind of sub-spectrum build quality with not a lot of RAM and a mess of wires inside, through to Panasonic and Sony uh, producing high-end machines that um, weigh 3.6 kilos and... Oh, really, really heavy. I mean, seriously, my hit bit's over there. My my original 75B MSX1 hit bit is over there. I'll just get it for you. Look, I'm seriously running out of room here. I can't even fit them both in frame. So here's the, here's, here's the big guys in terms of MSX um, build quality. And the CF2700 is heavier than the hit bit. Of course, they've got built-in power supplies. Um, so that makes it heavier, but yeah, two Japanese built MSX machine, no compromise has been made in build quality. As I say, this particular MSX, the 2700, was known as King Kong in Japan. Two cartridge slots on top and a nice, hopefully you see that dark grey case compared to the black of the MSX. This one's not in too bad condition, few little knocks, arrived on Saturday. Um, very, very nice. And of course, the MSX was huge in Holland. So I imported this one from Holland, although you'll see on the keyboard, it's a, a German model. Uh, and you to get some of the control, the kind of square keys and stuff there, you have to hold down code. And I think nine and eight and nine and so on to get the keys. It's not a problem. And not surprising, German models turn up in the Netherlands in the Netherlands, really. Um, it may have been there originally all the time, or it may have just kind of made its way over the border at some point since. I'll get rid of the hip bit, because we can then frame this shot a little bit more sensibly. The 2700 has more RAM than Japanese model. The Japanese model has 32K of RAM. This has 64. Um... In the Netherlands, it cost 842... Uh, what did the... Gilda. Was it Gilda they used to use? Or 939 Deutschmarks. Also available in the UK, but I can't find a UK price. Main Japan sticker on the front. All the best stuff's made in Japan, as Dave Jones always says. As I say, it's an MSX1. I really wanted an MSX2, but nothing available I could see at the moment. And, and this one caught my eye because I thought it's a Panasonic, it's gonna be built incredibly well. Keyboard feels expensive, just as nice as the hip bit that I reviewed before, not the MSX2, which has a slightly cheaper keyboard on the hip bit, but the MSX1 you just seen. Um, all the standard MSX stuff, so you've got a, a light up caps lock key down there, 
the cursor keys there, uh, which are all coloured in green. You don't see green on many 80s computers, do you? So it's nice to see that. Two cartridge slots on the top, and I don't know if you can hear that, but they're switched. And that means that it is impossible to plug a cartridge into a live system because it cuts it off. It, it's a protection mechanism, and you don't. That's not in the MSX spec, but each cartridge slot is micro switched, and uh, yeah, it, it manually disables the system when you put a cartridge in or pull it out. So to prevent damage. One power light there. And now you've got something unusual on the side. This thing's so heavy. You've got an unusual thing on the side here, if you can see that. I hope that's in focus. It's not very well lit, but um, if you can see there, there are little covers over the joystick ports and they're still intact. If you can see that, I'm just gonna try and get you focused. I can't actually focus, it's too, too dark. But uh, yeah, there's the joystick ports and two little covers that still actually are there. How are they not lost? Did the person who used this machine never use it for gaming or just gamed on the keyboard? Around the back as I maneuver this absolute unit of a machine to try and prop it up with my hand. Not a lot to see. Standard MSX printer port, cassette port, RF out with a channel adjust uh, screw there, composite video out, and a standard mono audio out as well. No RGB, nothing else like that, no monitor socket. The MSX spec only requires the RF and the composite. Additionally, MSX ones generate uh, not RGB internally, but a component. And therefore it is quite hard to convert that into RGB, which is why the hit bit I have gives us like bluish tint on the blacks because uh, Sony just, well, they didn't get a circuit working quite rightly, no matter, how much, no matter how much you dial in. Different settings internally on the pots internally, you can never get the blacks completely black without compromising the other colours. So there's no monitor there. The video output's very good, and um, we'll compare that a little bit later on, but it is com composite only. Uh, lots of vents for the power supply. I'm going to put that down there because it's really, really heavy. And a massive on-off switch here, really stiff. Can hear that uh, as it goes on and off and that's about all, all there is externally it's an absolute beast of a unit uh, the build quality is is something else and uh, well let's have a look inside and see what uh, Panasonic have done because it's always interesting to see you can everyone's got their own takes on the MSX standard especially in the earlier days because uh, later on there were standard chips you could buy and put into your MSX to make to make it all cheaper. But in the early days, there's a lot of discrete chips knocking around internally. But so far, very impressed with the build quality of this thing. Right, just gonna flip this absolute beast over. Have a look underneath. Panasonic CF2700. Uses 25 watts of power, weighs a ton, or well, 3.6 kilos, I think. And uh, Master Seat Electronic Company, Panasonic, made in Japan, and some stuff in German there that our German viewers, which are quite a few, will be able to read. I imagine it says, don't go inside, there is a danger of electrocution, only a Panasonic engineer should go in here. Um, I don't know, it might say, if you open this thing up, Panasonic will come around your house and beat you up. In which case, get commenting below. Right, um, Panasonic really don't want you inside here because it's taken me about four screwdrivers to find something long enough and uh, with the right kind of size of bit on the end that actually <laughs> reaches down into the depths of, of the case. Really deep screws. Uh, da, 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 da. Come on, come on, you coming out? You coming out to play? He says, that's definitely out. There we go. Right, let's see 
what they have in store for us. If it, how does it undo? Is there any more? Have I missed a screw somewhere? I don't think I have. It's clipped by the looks of it. So let's see. Let's see what we can do. Oh. There we go. Oh, many, many years of crusty. Oh, that's a funny underneath on the plastic there. Look at this. I'm going to have to get this a clean when I'm inside here, aren't they? Just kind of tarnish over the years. Masha C to Electronic, 1984. Electric, sorry. 1984. And look, the these bits have just fallen out. The joystick ports. How they've survived all these years, I have no idea. Oh, look at that. I've just noticed something. The cinch connectors on the cartridge port are metal, not plastic. When was the last time you saw that? Wow. But that, that material there, it's rough. The underside of the plastic, you can't see. Let me see if I can unplug the... That comes off there. I think that's about as far as we're going to get in terms of the internals of, of looking at this. Um, I'd, I'd like to disconnect that, but uh, and that's I don't want to strip that screw there because it's pretty stuck. But here we have the guts of the beast. How Panasonic, Mashisita, do an MSX. And uh, it's quite, well, um, massive power supply over there on the left. I'll tell you that much. With that switch, you can see why that switch is there. And those two earth straps onto the keyboard. Even the incredibly well-engineered BBC Micro only has one earth strap onto the keyboard. This beast has got has got two. And I'm imagining they've put there's a there's a tin hat on that modulator down there. Um usually you'd expect the modulator to be up by the the pins up there, although there's more underneath. Um, here, and I'm not sure I can get underneath to have a look. There's a some kind of daughter board running under there, but um, what have we got? Well, we've got let's get you, get, get you in close, I think. Probably the best we're going to get here 30 year old crud and stuff in here. Um, well, for start, we've got chips dated. Um, where is that? Week 6, 1985. Week 6, 1985 on the AY chip there. NEC chip there. Is that a Z80? Right, so that is an NEC version of the Z80 there. As you can see, sound chip, as I mentioned before. I'm interested to see what's under those cans, but I may not be brave to go underneath. Power circuitry over here, big fuse there and uh is that a cap or something there i can't quite see what that is from this angle that i'm over over here as i say those metal cartridge connectors are, are quite something um that's gonna cost you a bit more money when you're costing this together but i guess panasonic really didn't care um we've got our usual bits and pieces down there ram we've got a couple of wires running around the joystick ports that you quite often see on msx machines i'm never quite sure what a Panasonic wouldn't be bodging stuff, but you quite often see the kind of wires running around the uh, joystick area. Is it some kind of common connection? They need more supply over it than the board it's you can do on the on this with the PCB track you've got. Not sure. Um, what else we got on here? Voltage regulator there with no heat sink connected to it. That one's got a heat sink on it, but that one there does not. Got some big cap there hanging over those ICs there. You might have to watch that. Is that connected to is that connected there to stop it vibrating? Or is it connected there to dissipate some heat? Not sure. It's got some a bit of red stuff on the inside there. Um interesting i mean that's a little bit of a concern that just hanging over those chips if that cap ever breaks but it's not an awful lot of capacitors in it compared to say spectrum or something like that there's one two three four five six seven okay perhaps there's more than four, eight nine ten eleven twelve on the main board 
And then you've got some big ones up there that are presumably to do with power supply. I can see some Texas, Texas Instruments logos there, but I can't quite see the numbers on those chips. Um, it's, all, it's all very efficient, as you'd expect from Panasonic. I'd, I'd like to see what's potentially underneath the underneath um, this board and this daughter board, but I don't think I can really get in there. I could try and have a, have a quick lift, I suppose, but um, I don't know if... I don't know how much of this I'm going to show you because I really don't disassemble this machine any anymore. But you've got a I.O. board beneath there. And, yeah, it actually looks like the modulator is on a daughter board down, down below. But I don't know how much I can show you of, of, of that, really. Um, I'll try and lift it up. Can you just see in there? If you just see in there, there's a there's a little there's just a little daughter board down there that just does the I/O and uh, the composite out and the RF out, and it just connects with a, a ribbon cable running down to beneath it. Uh, quite a lot of shielding down below as well, but I um, mean that's your lot really down there this isn't gonna be one of those videos where i clean a machine up because i don't frankly have the time for that today what i have noticed however in here is most machines msx machines i come across have one glass fuse in the power supply but this one actually has a second one up there which is very interesting the extra protection there a little bit of extra engineering from panasonic um quite interesting but overall the impression inside is one of it's a very efficient considering that it doesn't have a dedicated MSX chip like later machines where they integrate a lot of the functions on onto a single chip. But, um, you know, two fuses, metal cartridge connectors, um, all, all very nice internally. Although if you do want some penny pinching, look, it's just a membrane keyboard under all this. For all the fancy feel of this keyboard... It is just a bog standard membrane, and you can see it um, beneath there as well. So now the switch stuff from your Sony with the Mitsumi keyboards, they have actually managed to cheap out a, at one stage of this. And likewise, if you remember when I looked inside the Sony hip bit, very expensive wired connectors going across to the main board, but uh, just just ribbon cables like Amstrad or Sinclair. Or, or Commodore even. So uh, not not all done to the very top end of, of building computers. So, and I've just got that back in, look after your membrane because you probably ain't getting another one. That's the problem with some of these uh, more obscure machines. Nobody doing new production runs of membranes like they are for Sinclair, Atari or, or Amstrad machines or, or, or Amigas. It is now many hours later or it feels like it. Piece of advice. Never take one of these apart. They're, they're hellish to get back together. I traced it to having to make sure the wire that connected the keyboard, and I've still got it wrong there. I can still see, I can, I've got a failed wire there. Ah, uh, yeah, horrible. It's, watch the wires between the keyboard, uh, not the keyboard, sorry, the grounding wire for the keyboard and the cartridge connector sense connect cable, because... They fail the cartridge port and you can't get it back together again. I've still got more work to do here because that's just... You can't see that there. There's a wire poking through the cartridge port. Joy. Anyway, let's have a look at some of the software you can run on MSX very quickly. So I plug the machine in with Composite. That's the only option available other than UHF. And here we go. MSX Basic version 1, as you'd expect to see on any MSX1 machine. And the composite picture was a little bit noisier on the blues than the Toshiba that I looked at a few months ago. But other than that, it looks like a good composite picture should look, really. And uh, one thing to mention, of course, on this MSX, it's a German keyboard, so Z is in the wrong place. Well, wrong place if you're used to a normal QWERTY keyboard. Let's put F1 Spirit in. And see how this compares.
And of course, the reds and blues, not as bold as you would expect on an RGB connection, but um, not looking too bad. It's certainly not a bad composite picture at all, and your eyes get used to it fairly quickly if you've come across some, an RGB MSX2. And here's what a Toshiba HX10 looks like, also composite. And look at the noise going down the panel artifacting on that vertical line on the right-hand side there. But well, that's not present on the Panasonic, so it's always going to be a bit of a payoff, different, different things. And here's what it looks like in RGB on my MSX2. It's a world away, really, isn't it? Run through a few games to see what they look like. Obviously, they're all MSX1 games. This is Fuse by the Pickford Brothers. One of my favourite games in the MSX. Got a great port of it. It looks good, actually. It looks very good. Nemesis. Looking exactly as you'd expect it to. All these high-end MSX machines are going to have a good output and look very similar. It's going to be minor differences as we saw with the HX10 with uh, slightly more PAL artifacting on some, but not a much. And here's Ghostbusters, and again, just want to see what that red looked like, that solid red. And yeah, it's not as solid as it would be an RGB, it looks like pinky, but it's not too bad at all. I expect they actually tweak the saturation levels down for the composite to stop artifacting because the more you turn it up the more artifacting you're going to you're going to get but overall it's not bad at all and exactly the kind of output i would expect from composite on one of the higher end msx machines so you can see there's a variety of games as as we know the msx check out the 50 msx games reviewed in under 10 minutes it's a nice enough machine here um, it's one of the better built MSX machines. Very nice video output for composite. Nothing skimped aside from the keyboard. Panasonic have put together a very competent machine. To be honest, you're fine with, with most MSXs. Any Sony, Panasonic, the Toshiba HX10 that I reviewed before is a lovely MSX as well. It, it depends on, on what you're after. If you're into hardcore MSX stuff, obviously MSX2 is a much better option, but finding those in the UK are next to impossible. You will be importing probably from the Netherlands or possibly Italy as well. But I um, hope you enjoyed a look at this particular MSX, the CF2700 from Panasonic. Interesting to see how the different takes on these machines all work. And I hope you join us again soon here on Chinivision. Ta-ra!